Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, weekly show about uh, Bitcoin and, and the future of money and so much more. My name is Paul Buitink, and my co-host uh, today is uh, Tim Pastor, the CEO and co-founder of Identify. He actually will be kind of the host today, and I will, I will um, sit back and, and let Tim do uh, most of the talking. Our guest today, I'm um, very honored to announce him, his uh, name is Mr. Dave Birch. He is a, a very uh, well-known payment consultant. He's a British author and the director of Consult Hyperion, a specialist electronic transaction consulting firm that advises governments and large companies on electronic identity and electronic money. I didn't make it up myself. It's all here on Wikipedia. <laughs> I made it up. You made it up. <laughs> you have some ghostwriters to, um, to update your Wikipedia entry. Um, as, as you can all see, he's a very well-read man. He, he has a lot of books there um, in the background, all of them. <laughs> Very, very interesting books. Uh, so, Dave, um, we spoke last week um, at the at the blockchain conference. Oh, I'm at Bitcoin no, no. conference. Bitcoin conference last Bitcoin week. Bitcoin. Next year it will be called the blockchain yeah. conference at the ING, and uh, there we exchanged a little bit. We had some differences of opinion in terms of, of money and privacy and other things. But um, so, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, and, thank you for uh, the invitation. And and I'm going to um, give the the floor to uh, Tim. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'm uh, very honored to uh, be interviewing Dave here. It's uh, my pleasure, Tim. Thank you. And uh, I've been uh, digitally stalking you for a while now, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I I do know a few things about you, but I've done my homework a little bit more extensively before the show, um, just to uh, get the details right. Uh, so first of all, I was curious if you could maybe tell a bit about yourself, because you've been working on Consult Hyperion uh, since around the time I was born, 1986. <laughs> um, so yeah. That gets me on your side right right away. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, could you could you maybe tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, Consult Hyperion was founded in the in the middle of the 1980s, and uh, many of the founders had a defence background. Uh, mine was a secure secure communications background. And, uh, and we knew a lot about <coughs> encryption and security and reliability and we thought that uh, we would find some opportunities to work for you know I guess mainly in defense and industry and it happened that uh, of course when I write my book I will explain how this was visionary strategic business planning by me it wasn't really it was just complete luck uh, it happened that the very first contract we ever won uh, was with the London Stock Exchange and it happened that at that time in the middle of the 1980s the financial markets uh, wanted to be able to it was the time of the big bang in London, the explosion in financial services and people wanted to be able to move data around faster and secure securely over networks and that was an opportunity for us and we began working with uh, the financial markets uh, Stock Exchange, Bank of England, from there we moved into working with the retail banks. That took us into uh, smart, you have to understand the sort of the arc. So in the mid-1980s if you had a PC and you wanted to connect it to the Bank of England you had a secure piece of hardware, a tamper resistant board that went inside the PC which cost, I don't know, $10,000 and that had the same security as the chip that you have on your chip and pin card now which costs 50 cents so we were in that period where we went from these complex expensive custom devices to, to smart cards and then to sims in mobile phones and and so on so that's what that's what took us into these markets and it turned out we were quite good at it and so we work around the world for uh, banks telcos card schemes that kind of thing okay cool so um, how did you uh, end up being a specialist, if I can call you a specialist or an expert on uh, within the payments industry? Because you said that you originally came from secure communications. I, I did, but my, and my, my colleagues uh, you know, knew, actually knew and know far more about security than I do. Mm -hmm. But um, when we began to work for the banks, I, I got very interested in, um, you know, this was the you know this is pre-internet remember this is late 80s early 90s and I I knew a lot about satellite communications so I did a lot of work on using satellites to, to move data around got very interested in what the data was used for um, payments became the uh, consumer retail 
mass market version of that and we've always been very interested in things that change the mass market. Mm -hmm. I became very fascinated in it. In the early 1990s we were fortunate enough to be chosen by NatWest Bank as it then was for a project called Mondex. Your listeners will all have forgotten all about this but in the early 1990s various banks and organizations around the world had a go uh, at cash replacement using chip cards. You're very, I'm sure you're utterly bored with the history of chipper and chipnip in the Netherlands. Uh, in the UK it was Mondex and Visa Cash, in Germany it was Geltkart and there were a million others at the time, Danmont, Semp, Semepa and so on and so on and so on. And, um, and so we were involved in, in planning the security and, and developing some of the systems and, and so on. And that got me, and of course, um, if you're forced to digitize something, if you're forced to write some software for something, uh, in, in my mind, I guess you, I'm from that legacy software world, um, you have to really understand it. If you're going to write a bit of code for something, you have to really understand it. And when we started writing code for money, I realized I didn't really understand money. And so I became very fascinated with the topic. To cut a long story short, in uh, 1997, we organized the first of us, of, which still run to this day, we organized the first uh, Consult Hyperion Forum uh, to bring together experts to discuss these things. I had one of the luckiest phone calls of my whole life because I went to the library to find out which was the best book on the history of money and the best book of the hi on the history of money was by a chap called Glyn Davies from the University of Wales and I called him up he didn't know who I was I asked him will you come and talk to these technology guys about money and he very graciously accepted gave a fabulous talk which completely changed my perspective on this. I realized that I didn't know anything about where money came from, how money worked, the history of money, the potential future of money, the drivers on money and in particular I didn't understand the complexity of the interrelationship between technology and money. Mm. There's a, there's a, they're, 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 they're interrelated but in a, in a much more interesting and much more complex way uh, than you might first think. And so I became very fascinated by that. As it happened, that was the kind of thing that our clients were interested in as well. Uh, and so we became, I like to think, we became the consultancy of choice uh, in some of those areas. And we've, we've continued with that to this day. So, yes, I won't pretend it was a brilliant, a lot of it was accidental. Yeah. But the core point is, and I think the Bitcoin generation is rediscovering this for themselves, just, just the same as I discovered back in the early 90s, is when you sit down to write the code for something, you, you need to understand it. And we all think that we know what money is because we never really think about it. Uh, but when you're forced to sit down and think about it, well, wait, hold on a second, where does this work? Where does it come from? What does it do? How is it a platform? Um, it's a fantastically interesting topic yeah. um, and I, I, I still find it fascinating today. So to s one more question on this part. Um, what was the part which uh, amazed you most during that time when you were discovering the wor inner workings of money and money creation? Um, well, uh, you, and you, you always see these things through a sort of rationalization looking backwards but I think at some point in that process I was slightly shocked to realize that the way money worked, I sort of assumed that it was the inevitable progression up a sort of evolution. We'd, we'd uncovered the perfect way that money should work and it's now a law of physics that you have a central bank and you have commercial banks and blah 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 and you have national currencies and of course as I began to study and learn I began to realize this is just a the way things are. This is just the result of a series of historical accidents and technological developments and actually there's no reason why money will work like this in the future and in fact I, I firmly believe money won't work, won't work like that in the future. Yeah. So, that's, so the realization that money is a technology and the way it works is a construct. It's, it's not that you've uncovered a law of nature. 
um, to me that I, that was quite a profound discovery. I think many many other people I'm sure knew this all along, but I didn't. So yeah. it was quite a discovery. Okay, so before we uh, we go to Bitcoin, because this show is about Bitcoin, of course. Uh, sure. But before we go to Bitcoin, um, what did you see as the biggest challenges ahead for financial institutions before Bitcoin was invented? Uh, how did that play out? Um, or was that process perhaps interrupted by the arrival of Bitcoin? Um, well, I, I think if, if, you, if we go back three or four years, um, the, the challenge for, well, I can only, for the financial institutions that we work for, banks primarily, um, the big challenge is, was, and actually probably still is, or in a slightly different way, disintermediation. So once it became clear that other organizations could run payments, could run money, could do all of these things, uh, I, I don't want to be utterly tedious on the topic, but you, you probably also need to go back and understand the regulatory co-evolution at the same time, because this was uh, through the period of electronic money licensing and the first payment services directive, and it became clear that the direction of travel would take things like payments away from financial institutions so that other people could do it. <clears throat> then, I mean, depending on which models that you use, uh, you can see payments as a kind of, uh, I mean, I'm paraphrasing it because this isn't quite how I see it, but you could sort of see payments as a kind of gateway into the financial system. And if they lose payments, uh, you know, because they have, they, I mean, banks, if they lose payments because they have an intermediary between them and the customer that handles this, Facebook or Apple or Google or Microsoft or Venmo or anybody else. I mean, I think it's sort of interesting. We're talking the day after Facebook launched their P2P payment service in the US. Then um, the banks might be reduced to the role of utility executional factories sitting behind that. And... Uh, for some banks, actually, who knows, that, that might be a good choice. But I've been to enough business school lectures to know that there's a difference between becoming a pipe um, as a strategic choice uh, and choosing a tactical approach to operational excellence which can keep your market position. There's a difference between that and becoming a pipe because you didn't see what was coming, because you were outmaneuvered because you were just reduced to the role of a pipe. Yeah. So I think that disintermediation is still true. Now because as this conversation goes on, um, we're, we're going to disagree at some point about how important Bitcoin is in all of this. It's, I, I don't think Bitcoin has changed those dynamics on the retail banking side. I don't. Okay. It's interesting because uh, last week during the National Bitcoin Congress, um, I wasn't there, unfortunately, but um, I did see it live, so I was happy to be able to see it live. Yeah, it's uh, a very enjoyable event. I thought it was a fair, they had a very good program, very good mix of speakers. Yeah. Looks very good, I agree. Um, but you said that the future of money isn't Bitcoin. That's right. The future of Bitcoin isn't money. Could you maybe elaborate <laughs> a little bit on that? Because I think well, <clears throat> they're confused by that quote. Uh, when I went to the very first, I went to the very first European Bitcoin conference, which was in Prague. I, I can't be bothered to Google it, but I think it was 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, most of the people in the room were very, very young uh, and dynamic and energetic, which I'm not. Um, but I can remember, I can remember DigiCash and Hashcash and Millicent. Uh, and all these other things. So I can remember the branches on the evolutionary tree that have grown into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so my mental model was slightly different. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to annoy people by saying this, but I thought there was a sort of slightly religious aspect to the first Bitcoin conference I went to. It's if Satoshi Nakamoto was a prophet who had, this thing had come into his head and he had shared it with people. There didn't seem to be any awareness that this is a family of protocols that have roots mm -hmm. and can grow further, right? So in, in my head, Bitcoin was a stage on this growth and I'm sure other things will come afterwards and it will mutate and grow. So I never saw Bitcoin as the, uh, as the end product. But as I read the original paper and as I listened to the discussions 
and then went back and, and bounced these around with my colleagues. I got more and more interested in the blockchain technology and the idea of permissionless innovation on an albeit computationally expensive platform and I found I could not get excited or enthusiastic about the currency. Um, so in other words, so the reason why I turned this into the soundbite, well the reason why I turned it into the soundbite is because I live on Twitter and I needed to be retweeted and I understand how to get retweeted. Yeah. Uh, you know. So, but the reason I turn into Soundboy is because I don't think the future of money is Bitcoin. If I was to make a choice right now, if I was the, if I was the uh, the friendly dictator in the UK, and I wanted to make the UK economy more efficient by replacing physical cash with electronic cash, I would I would want something a, a, a more like M Pesa than Bitcoin. I mean, I would want. Uh, you know, simple account to account transfers. I would add uh, a pseudonymous front end because I have privacy issues about that. But <clears throat> in terms of cost and efficiency and speed, you may as well have effectively something like PayPal but run by the Bank of England. Just a big database. And if I send you some money, it's just a few bytes changing in a database. And it all works absolutely fine. So. So the future of money I don't see as being uh, Bitcoin. I mean, I certainly see the future of money as being uh, devolved and in many cases private and much richer and more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a link between communities and currencies which will flower under the new technology. But I, I wouldn't see Bitcoin as the... I mean, I don't. you'd have to convince me that the design goals for a currency were such that they could be met by Bitcoin and that's really not clear to me at all. Okay. Um, so the future of money isn't Bitcoin and then I said the future of Bitcoin isn't money because I think the Bitcoin technology, the, what we will use Bitcoin for in the future, uh, whether it's uh, as we would do, <laughs> whether it's storing uh, letters of credit or dishwasher warranties or you know side chains for particular industries or uh, smart contracts for something or other, or colored coins for NASDAQ, whatever the future of Bitcoin is, that future isn't money. That future is, I don't want to say it, but it's more closely linked to uh, identity and reputation uh, and, and so on. So, that, so I boiled all that down into the little soundbite, and I know, it, I know it would annoy the purists to say that, but hey, it got retweeted like a gazillion times, so I won. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was curious about that part. Uh, just to hear it from your side, um, but you, you mentioned that you think it might be a good idea. Um, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, as I understood it, you said that you thought you think it might be a good idea if people would have a bank account directly with the central bank. Um, Paul just moved back from Ecuador back to the Netherlands. Uh, he has some experience over there. Maybe Paul would like to say something about this. Yeah, and Dave, to what extent are you aware of this system in Ecuador? I, I know this is in Ecuador, yeah. Yeah, so I just moved back uh, from Ecuador and uh, it was being rolled out um, as I lived there and I was actually one of the first <laughs> people to uh, to use it, to experiment with it. There was There's just only a few places in the country where you can uh, use it, but there was this um, fish soup store where uh, close to where I live where I, uh, where I bought and where I used the system. And the merchant loved it because instead of paying 3% to Diners Club, they just paid 3 cents to the central bank, and instead of having to wait three days, they got it in three seconds. Um, so for the merchant, it was uh, it was a very convenient tool. Um, but uh, what, what, do you, what do you think of the system? I think the Ecuadorian system illustrates um, illustrates a great many of the key points in money. So, uh, so for people who are listening who don't understand the situation there, Ecuador operates what economists would call a currency board. So, so in Ecuador, the uh, the unit of account is the U.S. dollar, and if you want, uh, and it's U.S. dollars that circulate, uh, and there are also, actually, rather interestingly, there are some U.S. dollars, like fifty cent coins, which are not tender in the U.S. but but are, are legal True. in Ecuador. There's already so, a parallel currency in a way, which is just, yeah. just 40, 40 million dollars uh, in total or so. But yeah, there is a, a coin circulating that is only accepted 
in, 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 in Ecuador, but within Ecuador they see it as dollars, so there's no... That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. And that's, uh, but I think, don't you think that's very fascinating? I mean, the little story of that tells you so much about money and what money is. Now, and so I would say, well, you know, look, if you want to have an efficient national electronic money system, then what they're doing is a really good thing, right? Because for the, remember, cash discriminates most heavily against the poorest people. It's the poorest people who have their money stolen, taken away from them in bribes, uh, they lose it, uh, they have to spend time queuing to get it or transporting it around to pay bills and so on. So the costs of cash fall most heavily on the poorest people. So as a national project, the idea of replacing cash with this electronic uh, money, uh, Ecuador Peza or whatever, that, uh, I mean, everybody has can have access to a feature phone and, and so yeah. on. Uh, that's actually a really, really good thing. However, well, what, yeah, what about the counter argument? A lot of people say, well, then of course uh, there's a privacy privacy thing, of course, and secondly, um, then you are depending on the on the capacity of the central bank to create more and more of those units until it's high, until. Well, high that's the problem. Put, so, so, so put privacy to one side for a moment, because that that that's a general issue with all of these, and I have the same general problem and I and I think the same general solution with all of these things so so put privacy to one side and let's imagine they'd come up with a with a solution which had appropriate privacy safeguards in it I still would be uncomfortable with the Ecuadorian system and the reason for that is because the reason why the electronic money will have value to the merchant is because it's redeemable at par now if the Ecuadorian government is going to hold a one-to-one -one US dollar reserve against the units of electronic currency that are issued, that's absolutely fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. In fact, if they applied to issue it in the European Union under the provisions of a European electronic money issuing license, that's exactly what they have to, have to do. There are very strict provisions on what you can do with your float uh, in Europe. But many people have the suspicion, I, I'm not saying this, I'm just reporting what other people have said, many people have the suspicion that the government will uh, issue electronic currency for which there's no reserve and in order to pay their own bills and to, to uh, pay public sector workers and so on and so forth. That's a general impression like most of my friends and people I know there especially ones that are educated or having um, businesses they do fear that at some point we'll see a parallel currency there um, so you have like an Ecuador and a US dollar because the, the backing will at some point... Um, and the, equi be the Ecuador will slide against the US yeah, dollar. Exactly. Yeah. So it's no, I, market, you know. I, 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 I agree with that completely. But that's not a function of the technology. I mean, that would, you know, you know in, in that particular example, you could use that technology, as they do in Kenya, mm -hmm. to issue electronic money that has a stable 100% reserve and the thing works beautifully and you have a whole new economy building up on top of it and, and that it's reasonable for Ecuador to aim for that but you need a transparency to make that work because people have got to be able to log on I mean um, you, you know what I mean I've got to be able to log on to the central bank and see there's one US dollar there for every electronic US dollar that's been issued and, and unless I can do that um, you know I, I might have some suspicions so we we already mentioned privacy here uh, a few times, but um, a little while ago on Twitter, I believe, uh, as a re in a reaction to one of Paul's tweets, uh, you mentioned that people should have the right to privacy, um, but not so much to be anonymous. But if I understand correctly, the r privacy itself would be that you are the person who has the choice to decide whether what kind of information you'd like to share with anybody else. So in that case, you would also have the right to to be anonymous, right? I made a uh, I made a, a little video. I'm just going to look for it now, um, which was originally done, not not really as a joke, but to make a point. I'll see if I can find it. I'll post the link in. So you could imagine a situation where my identity is cryptographically protected, so that I'm private, unless I do something wrong, in which case the identity can be revealed. So, or so to take a very simple version of this, right? Um, uh, uh, I, have a, I have a mobile banking application on my phone. The mobile banking application generates a key pair. The private key goes to the bank. The bank 
gets me to log in, it knows I'm Dave Birch, it then signs the key and sends it back with a certain set of attributes. Yeah. This person is over 18, they live in the UK, but not my name. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I can transact in complete confidence. You can transact with me in complete confidence. You don't know who I am, but you know for certain that Barclays knows who I am. Mm -hmm. Right? ING sure. could just, interact just. with me because they know cryptographically for sure Barclays know who I am. So the fact that you don't know who I am doesn't matter. The yeah. transaction can still proceed. Yeah, but so if I do something wrong, if I break the law, the police can get a warrant and go to Barclays, and of course Barclays will tell them. By Dave Birch. Exactly. So I can't, I can't use it to do anything bad. So this would be a system with a trusted third party in the system, right? This would yeah. be possible yeah. in a trustless system like Bitcoin, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a nice, nice link, I think, um, because you're apart from having a lot of knowledge being well credentialed on the part of uh, payments, uh, you're also uh, well credentialed on identities. Uh, the two are linked. They, yeah, they are very interlinked, okay. I think. Yeah. And um, so what do you see as the key issues surrounding Bitcoin? Because the example that you've just mentioned is uh, uh, based on a trust-based system. So one where you have an intermediary, where you have a, a trusted third party. Uh, but Bitcoin itself is a trustless system. So uh, what are the key issues surrounding Bitcoin and identities? Well, look, so yes, I, I mean, I do believe the relationship between money and identity is um, is very close. Uh, I'm in fact, I'm probably at the extreme end of that spectrum because I think in reputational groups where you can authenticate uh, the relevant attributes with, with certainty, then the use of money as an intermediary begins to fall away mm -hmm. because you can maintain the shared ledger Mm -hmm. of uh, cross claims within the group with That's with certainty and so this is what people this is the the idea of the new neolithic yeah so when we were in a little tribe together in the stone age each of us could remember all of our obligations right i o u i don't know a stone or whatever else they had in the stone age i don't know mm -hmm. uh, uh you're going to help me uh, milk the cow i will help you collect stones for a wall, I mean, whatever. Uh -huh. we, can, we can remember all of those things. So we, we, don't, we don't need money. Um, and so, so I'm at the extreme end. I think you can, you can see a situation where a sophisticated identity infrastructure which manages these reputations and the cross obligations that go with them, you know, takes over. So I, you know, I, I can genuinely being accused of being an identity extremist. I mean, it's not going to happen for a long time. Same here, by the way. So. <laughs> but, but Dave, I always, I always wonder with these schemes, uh, also when I look, think back of, of the um, times in Mesopotamia with the, with the clay tablets, uh, I understand this scheme of, of interrelated debts and claims and all, and all of that, but what is the unit of account in such a scheme then? That that's a really interesting question. That's going to waste the rest of the half an hour if we spend our time uh, talking about this. But uh, but you see, the unit of account um, might not be. So if you don't have an intermediary, I'll, I'll give you an example. I I don't know what a dollar will be worth in 50 years' time, right? Like when I'm retired, hopefully. Um, I don't know how much things. Are, but I know that I will need so many kilowatt hours per day to heat my house. So in a way, a savings account that lets me store away kilowatt hours is more useful than a savings account that lets me store away dollars because I don't know how many kilowatt hours those dollars are going to buy in the future. So I might prefer to have the certainty of the kilowatt hours rather than the intermediary. So what's the unit of account? Well, there's lots of units of account. There's water and electricity and energy and uh, I mean, if you want to summarize it for argument purposes, you can you can go down the sort of uh, the sort of long finance route and say you have your you have your credit rating and you have your parking space, you know, and this is about it. Um, so I so I can you know I picking a unit of account when you have to work between these, but if you don't have to work between them, then you don't need a unit of account. Uh, that balances each of them. But as I say, you know, that, that's an extreme position, and although I hold it, <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a universal uh, view of the future.
So you would see the future money system which would be based on identities as merely a scoreboard, if I say that correct? Uh, well, I think, I think you know, look, again, it's all to do with sound bites. Identity is, a new, identity is the new money. Yeah. It's a much better sound bite than mutual cross obligations in reputational groups will be the basis for, you know, commerce. That's too long. The publisher didn't uh, yeah. make that one. So, so for a shorthand, we'll say identity is the new money. Mm -hmm. But you, but you, but you know what I mean. Now, what do, what does that mean for what does that mean for Bitcoin? So the argument with the argument with Bitcoin is, um, I mean, let's distill it down, um, and I will I will make caricatures of the argument to infuriate Paul, and then we'll then we'll use them as straw men for discussion. So the first one is people don't want money that is controlled by the government or something. They want money that is like gold and is. Uh, you know, uncontroversial, whatever. So that's the first. Uh, I think Paul probably thinks that's true. I, I really don't. I, I don't want money that's outside democratic control. I don't want to live in a society where uh, we don't have uh, we don't have influence over these things. It's all very well to be nostalgic about the gold standard, but the gold standard ended in a global recession because uh, you know that was that's not a good outcome. That's not the sort of thing we want. Um, so, so argument one is we want money that's not under government control. I'm, I'm not sure that's true. Not obvious to me at all. We might not like the way money works right now. We might want money to work in better ways. Uh, but can I already counter this argument? And, no, please, uh, please, please, before we move yeah, to yeah. the next one, um, because you say um, democratic control. Let's just assume that means that uh, the majority can vote for a certain change or whatever. With Bitcoin, we clearly see that it is a consensus-driven protocol where people, when they form a majority, can make certain changes. So um, it's not like a static thing at all. I don't, I don't quite understand the the point. The thing is, if it, well, you, you, know, you said you don't want to be, you don't want to subject yourself to something that you cannot control democratically, right? Yes, and, that's and my right. My point is that Bitcoin is not just a static thing that will not change anymore. Uh, as we see, for example, with the whole block size debate that I'm sure you're following, you can see that people are trying to form a consensus as to whether they want to increase the size or not. So it's not, uh, that that's basically my refutation to your point, that it is indeed something that can change based on the, on the, on the desires of the users that, that uh, use the system. Yeah, or look at Greece, for example. Uh, it might not be uh, the best way of making this point, but the idea would be that if that this would be a democratic money system, then if the ma majority of the, the Greeks would vote for reopening the banks tomorrow, that they would reopen, right? But but that's <laughs> I'm, I'm you know democracy allows people to vote for stupid things. I'm I'm sorry, but that's just part of the way it works. I you know if it was up to me, uh, I would I would certainly. Uh, narrow the franchise uh, slightly. It's it's not obvious to me that absolutely everybody should be voting, um, but I'm afraid there's until somebody can come up with a better alternative, we're we're sort of stuck with that. Private currencies, you know, you you, uh, you don't have to have fiat currencies in order to have that element of control. Uh, you know, this is the sort of neo Hayekian perspective that we were discussing last week in Amsterdam, which is you can have uh, currencies that are issued by private organizations um, but under rules that are democratically set rules which set what reserves they have to hold or, or you know whatever or yeah you, you, know, you, could, you could argue even that there is no such thing as a public entity because a public entity is in, is in, a, in a way it's a group of people sharing a piece of land with a board of directors, that's what a country is basically, right? Even though there there is not not a very firm contract uh, with that <laughs> particular organization, you could uh, you could sort of see any public entity as just a bunch of people collectively owning a piece of land, which is a true. So true. In a way, in a way, the world already consists of all sorts of uh, um, public currencies that we call or private currencies that we call public currencies. But I think. Where we're going to perhaps is a world where people can form collectives, even though they're not even based in the same country, and come up with their own system, like for example Bitcoin. And now, actually, I, I agree with one part of that. I mean, we're, we're not. That's, that's we're, a win. That's a win. We're, we're we're not so far apart on some of those aspects. So I I've written quite a few times that I think 
the future of money because because technology lowers the cost of creating money, lowers the cost of monetary experimentation. You would expect to see more currencies. And I've, I mean, I can't prove this. I don't think, but I feel uh, with some reasonable that that uh, cu currencies which are going to be linked to communities, um, you, you can see currencies which reduced the cost of transactions within a community, um, potentially at the expense of raising the transaction cost between communities. You can sort of see that and so that suggests to me that those communities will be the basis of the currencies. However, as you've pointed out, community now does not mean what community meant in the Stone Age, right? So in the Stone Age, the reputational group was geographically very limited and it had kinship bonds to, to support reputation. Could you imagine, so what, you're, what, what you've just said sounds to me like, could you imagine, uh, for example, an Islamic diaspora that has an electronic dinar that they use between, absolutely I can imagine that completely. Yeah. Could, could I imagine um, a gold-backed currency that some people wanted to use? Absolutely. Can I imagine currencies that are based on hyper-local groups? I can imagine all of those things. Can you imagine brand-based currencies? You know, this is the sort of Edward de Bono, um, you know, currency as a as a kind of advanced loyalty. I can imagine all of those things. So I agree with you about community being the basis yeah. of future currencies. I I don't quite see how that takes you to Bitcoin though. Okay, fair enough. But isn't isn't that just the the um, the prime example of how a community of like-minded people Gets together and come up with their own currency. Yeah, that might well that might well be true. And if it was a plausible hypothesis that Bitcoin had sprung into existence as the perfect way of implementing currency, uh, that might be an argument. But that's like you saying to me, like 200 years ago, hey, look, you know, this guy, Jane, he's invented this steam engine for pumping water out of mines, this is the perfect steam engine, we should all be using that. And I'm saying, actually, what he's invented is an engine, and the fact that people can build on that engine and improve it and take it in direction is absolutely fantastic, but it does not seem to me that that engine is going to be what we'll all be using in 50 years' time or 100 years' time, and I, I think I can support that. And, I, and I'm not just saying that in a sort of using trivial and inappropriate historical metaphor. I'm saying it because I think if you were to sit down and try to get a mandate for the requirements for a new kind of money, um, I, don't, I don't think they would match with the Bitcoin requirements. I've said the issue about uh, control, which actually no, nobody is arguing with me about this on Twitter at the moment, so I don't know. Either nobody's listening or I'm so utterly convincing that, uh, that they've got no argument. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the issue about uh, the sort of anonymity of Bitcoin. The not really anonymity, but sort of anonymity. So rather than have uh, something like that, uh, either something that's fully accounted and has no privacy, or something with this sort of weird sort of anonymity where you can actually be tracked, I would like to have money that offered actual privacy, cryptographically uh, provided privacy. So I, so I want money where it's one of the design goals that provided you're obeying the rules, again under democratic control, uh, your transactions are private and if there's you misbehave or there's some suspicion then they can be revealed and that needs to be a construct not a byproduct of the way the thing is implemented. So I think that's that's an important aspect to it as well. I, I don't know how I don't know how you feel about the idea of building in privacy like that. I mean, presumably that's more appealing to you. Well, for me, the most important um, aspect is that people um, come up with something that they voluntarily agree with, and I guess this system um, could be something that people could agree on, and then it's fine with me. Okay, so that that would be a, a, a step forward in that as well. Yeah. But um, we, um, Tim, maybe I can because we uh, we have to wrap up uh, any time as soon. What? So let me just um, ah. give them give them the floor back to to uh, to Tim and see if there's any uh, remaining questions he has for Dave. Um, well, you you wrote a book, of course, on uh, which is titled "Identity Is Money." Um, Thank you for mentioning it. 
Yeah, no problem. To be honest, I at the same time I do have to admit that I haven't read it yet, but it is on my watch list, and I uh, mean that sincerely. Um, All I care is that you paid for it. <laughs> well, I haven't, so I'm going to try and download it somewhere. <laughs> <after> the <show. laughs> no, but the first thing that comes to mind when reading that title is, but is identity really the money there? Isn't it the reputation that intertwines with that identity? Money. But I, 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 I agree with that completely, but as I said earlier on, it's not a very good book title. Yeah, it's, it's about soundbite probably. But, uh, but you're right, it's about, uh, it's about um, ultimately it is more about reputation. And for reputation to work, mm -hmm. you need to have this, um, sorry, I've just posted the, if anyone's interested in the video link about, about uh, I think you might find it mildly interesting to look at this little video about uh, two different kinds of ways of paying for things. Okay. Um, uh, if you have uh, something that's based on reputation, something that's based on trust, I want that to have a hard infrastructure in the sense that I want the identification, the authentication, the reputation. I want all of those things to be real and built on real uh, cryptography. Right? Mm -hmm. And so this is, why, this is why I keep cycling back to this point about the blockchain as an immutable record of things, mm -hmm. um, that sort of fits with my notions of, of managing reputation. The idea that you're, you're, I mean this is a trivial version of it, but the idea that you are a sort of wallet and in this wallet you have coins which say uh, I, I have this loan, or I live in this country, or, I, or whatever. These are, and I can take these coins out and, sh and demonstrate ownership of the coins to people in order to do something, in order to gain access to something or exchange. So I, you know, I, I, I want to get access to your house, so I have to show you that this co I have this Airbnb booking. It's me. I own the... Pro I, I don't see exactly how that would work yet, but I can sort of see... Mm -hmm. That that's a useful way of thinking moving forward. So, when uh, last question then, because we have to wrap up, sure. uh, I would I would love to continue this conversation much longer, but we have to end it at some point. I, I literally that's a very bad thing. I never get bored talking about these things. <laughs> yeah, I can I can I can do it as an Olympic sport. <laughs> well, I would love to join you on that one as soon as we get to that point. Um, but the last question then uh, about reputation and you mentioned the example of storing it on a blockchain. To what extent do you think it's a good idea to store reputation on a blockchain? Because the whole idea of, uh, well, at least the Bitcoin blockchain uh, is the immutability part. And um, if you want to forgive somebody, do you, do you have to actually store this reputation on a blockchain and can it also become dangerous in some form? That, that's actually a very good point and, and deserves more discussion in its own right, I think. Um, a, the Bitcoin blockchain is a, is a computationally very expensive way of maintaining this ledger. So if we want to find applications for the blockchain, that blockchain, we need to look for applications where the uh, public nature of the record, of the immutable record, outweighs the computational expense. Which, by the way, I think isn't true for a lot of the potential applications that are being discussed. B because they're, they're between trust groups and the, and the cost of managing a shared ledger between trust groups uh, you know, is, is much, much less than the cost of maintaining a ledger which must be censorship resistant to all yeah. forms of bad actors. So, uh, so if you're going to find applications there, you've got to find things where the persistence of this public record, in a, in a weird way, has to meet some kind of private uses, right? Because otherwise, if you're just giving stuff away for free, like how is there a business on top of that? So this really interesting combination uh, of, of transparency and privacy and security is a very fertile ground, I think, uh, for, for new kinds of applications. So the example I used in the Netherlands last week, I said, uh, and this is not my example, this is an example that goes back to the 1930s, uh, and that's the idea that it's, it's very, I mean, there's sound bites coming again, warning. Um, you can't rob a glass bank, that's the sound bite, right? If, yeah. you can make a, if you can make a bank out of glass, 
it's very difficult for people to steal money from it because if people are inside stealing money everybody walking past can see so can you can you take the concept of a glass bank and build that using blockchains and the answer to that seems to me to be quite possibly yes right and there are other things you need to do this I see there was more discussion on Twitter today about Eric Hughes uh, mid-90s idea about uh, open book accounting homomorphic encryption maintaining public ledgers with private information on you know I don't know what the answer to that is but I can see that if guys like you can find a way of anchoring identity in the blockchain there is a possibility for building blockchain applications which have this incredible transparency which is a which is a very beneficial public good mm -hmm. and make the computational expense worthwhile while maintaining private information which means yeah. businesses you know c can use them so I'm I think that's a very fertile area for thought okay, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I could keep asking you more questions for many more hours, but uh, I, you guys, I, I, I genuinely don't know where this is going any more than anybody else is going. But unless we question each other mm -hmm. like this, we we don't make progress. I, I love being questioned, and, and and critical thinking in this area is really, really very vital. Great, same here. I always love to uh, uh, invite people to challenge my thinking and uh, my sometimes biased views in, on something. No, my biased views are biased too. Yeah. We, we all have that issue, I guess. I actually thought you you want you used the example of the glass bank to um, to make it very clear how fragile banks still are built from glass. <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a multi-purpose metaphor. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but no, I was I was using it to point out about transparency. Yeah, exactly. The 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 blockchain might be a way of constructing private institutions which are yeah. transparent and open to inspection, and yeah. that would be that would be an interesting new way of running some businesses. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, first question. Uh, sorry, yeah, we're really going to wrap yeah, it up. We need to we need to wrap it up then. Tim. Yeah, one one no more, problem. just a little side note then, perhaps, because um, it's more of a philosophical question. But the first question that arises to my mind when you mention the idea of a glass bank is: Do we still need KYC AML regulations then? If it's all, <laughs> if it's all glass. But yeah, maybe that's well, a AML. Uh, I mean, I'm going to say something quite controversial here because I think. The answer with AML might well be no. AML is what you have to have because you can't see all of the transactions. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a transparent infrastructure where the, uh, the police or the government, where legitimate law enforcement agencies can follow the trail of transactions, then why would you need AML? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can see all the transactions, you don't need AML, right? Well, as long as you have KYC. KYC is a little different, and I can see why binding to legal entities is, for, is you know, is obvious. We do, none of us want to live in a lawless world. We want KYC, but we want reasonable KYC. We don't have a strong enough digital identity infrastructure at the moment to make KYC as simple and or more cost-effective than it is now. That's one of the reasons why the costs keep escalating. But the technology might provide for a way of doing KYC in a more efficient way, which actually makes it better, makes it more useful. Right. Okay, then we have some people asking where the video link is, but I'll put the video link in the show notes so everyone can um, can uh, look it up. The, thanks very much, Paul. I'll post yeah. it on Twitter in a minute as well. Right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dave, for being on the show. And, and oh, thank really you. It's been thanks. so interesting, guys. I'm, I'm flattered to be asked. Yeah, well, let's do it again in the future, and uh, we'll be a very exciting year, I guess, with all these new insights and, and technologies coming together. That's great. Thanks very much, guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.